Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to be here. This is brought to you by the NJSBDC, Small Business Development Center of the state of New Jersey. This is NJ Thrives, in a small business series of webinars where we provide you resources, we provide you great counseling, mentorship for to help your business uh, grow, thrive, start. We are here to help you. My name is Marjorie Salas. I'm your host. I'm also the owner and founder of Iori Digital. It's a marketing and advertising agency with over 13 years of experience. So we are America's New Jersey Small Business Development Center Network. We are a statewide program powered by the SBA and partners to help small businesses in New Jersey do three main things. Number one, no cost business consulting. Number two, training and events starting at zero cost. And number three, we provide small business resources to help your business start, grow, and thrive. And I always like to say this, but I'm very proud to be one of, my business is one of the program. I was mentored by the program and much of my success is thanks to the guidance of all the counselors and all the webinars I took um, from the NJSBDC. If you've seen the map of New Jersey, you will have a counselor near you. Even if you're all the way down in Cape May, you can get counseling from someone in Bergen County. So that's totally beautiful. We have multiple centers and we're always available to help your business grow. Today's agenda, we have a few headlines, we have an amazing presentations by our presenter, and then we will be moving into the Q&A section. So today's headlines, we, are, we have very exciting headlines here. We have New Jersey minimum wage to surpass $15 an hour. This is a short read, it's, it's got great information. Um, I'm sure that many of many businesses have been paying $15 an hour, but um, we have, there's money in New Jersey, small businesses are thriving, and we are very excited to say that New Jersey's minimum wage has already passed the $15 um, minute, minimum hour per hour uh, targeted by Governor Murphy. That's a sign that our businesses are moving forward. We have great development, and we're also working with the community. The next headline is NJEDA announces $12 million in funding to 48 cannabis equity grants awardees. So if you are part of the cannabis industry, this is amazing. I would love to meet someone who won one of the grants. I'm sure the business is thriving and they're using the funds to help their business grow. Um, you also will find additional resources. Um, I can see quickly that the startups um, were awarded uh, 250,000 grand, the largest kind of cannabis social equity grant of its kind in the nation. So it's very, very cool. Um, this is a short read and it has some additional resources for you to follow. Last but not least, we have $3 million grants available for hiring um, women and minority in construction. So if you have a construction business and you're looking to bring females into um, as part of your labor force, there is a grant for your business. Um, they will be providing uh, workshops and additional resources. Just make sure you follow the the link, um, it says that applications must be submitted to the NJDOL by noon on October 20th. Grant applications themselves must be submitted by noon on August 27th. So if you want to take advantage of this award and you belong to the construction industry, make sure you submit to get that grant. Let me go back to my screen. Some things to keep in mind, please, is make sure you type your 
questions in the Q&A box. And it is very, very important for myself, for the speaker, and for future speakers that you submit a three-minute webinar. Um, once you submit that webinar, um, three-minute questionnaire webinar, so sorry. Um, once you submit that three-minute webinar questionnaire, um, we will reply back to you with the resources. So make sure you you submit um, your questionnaire. It's less than three minutes. It's just a few short questions. You submit it, and then we'll reply back with a copy of the presentation our speaker will be showing today. So with further ado, we have Michelle Schapp. She's an NJSBDC consultant, and she will be teaching us about revealing cybersecurity myths for small businesses. I'm a small business and I know the myth will be, oh, I don't need to have protection because I don't have that many clients, but here I am. I am ready to take all notes um, by Michelle. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Okay, I'm now unmuted. Can you also show my face? Ah, there we go. Modern technology. It's a yes, wonderful it thing. Of course, it works when it wants to. Well, with further ado, now that we have everything working, here's Michelle. She will be answering all my questions. I have pen and paper and I'm ready to take notes, Michelle. Well, before we get started, and thank you very much for the introduction, if people don't mind taking a minute, even less, to throw into the chat, a one word, one sentence piece of information about the industry that you're in or the industry that you serve. So whether you're in marketing, whether you're house cleaning, anything in between, it would be helpful for me to know what industries you folks are all in, because there are obviously different considerations depending upon the type of industry that you're in. So we have education, e-commerce, we have private investigator. Oh, that makes for a lot of interesting data that you have. We have municipal government, government contracting, wet cement built. Ah, remember that if you want to hire a woman in your business, you can get a grant for that. Let's see, we have sustainable packaging, marketing. Let's see, we have all sorts of interesting businesses here. And for those of you that haven't been keeping on the chat, take a look for yourself to see who else is on the webinar with you. We've got somebody who's regulated by HIPAA, so hopefully you're already compliant with a lot of the requirements that we're going to be speaking about. For the person who is in education and e-commerce, to the extent that you're a vendor to school districts that receive public funds, you're subject to FERPA. Hopefully that is something that is on your radar screen. I see recruiting, accounting, municipal government and government contracting. You folks have obligations. We have an SAS consultant, research and development, construction, telecom, fine art. Very interesting collection of folks here. And with that, I'm going to jump into our program. But again, as was already mentioned, if you have any questions please do not hesitate to either put them into the chat or pose them at the end. But the goal here is for this to be a value to you and not just for me being Charlie Brown's teacher speaking at you. So with that, we're going to get into the slide deck. And... Can you folks all see the screen? Can somebody please confirm that for me? Yes, looking great. Thank you. Terrific. So as I'm sure a lot of you are thinking to yourselves, although hopefully not since you're attending today's webinar, you think your business is too small to be a target. That and many other myths are going to be dispelled today. But of course, no presentation by an attorney would be complete without a legal disclaimer. So here is our legal disclaimer. Let's move on to more important information. For those of you who remember what is now ancient history 10 years ago, when Target had its major breach just before the holiday season, it was caused not by Target itself, although, by the way, Target did have warning bells and whistles that it ignored, but it was caused by its HVAC vendor. 
and it was because the HVAC vendor's environment was not secure. The bad actor got into the HVAC's vendor system and from there got on got into not only Target, but several other vendors. I'm sorry, very several other customers of Target's environments. It's only the Target one that made the headlines. There were a lot of other businesses that used this HVAC vendor that were compromised because of this one failure to secure information by one small vendor. Think about that implication for your business, whether you're a vendor for a target, a vendor for a school system, for a healthcare provider. And by the way, if you are a vendor for a healthcare provider, even if you yourself are not a healthcare provider, you may have signed a business associate agreement. Under that business associate agreement, you have taken on the obligation and you have warranted that you have appropriate security measures in place to protect the data that's been entrusted to you. One of the people that's on our webinar today is a private investigator. Think about the type of information that investigator might have, whether it's compromising pictures, whether it's information as to whether or not somebody went to a particular location to see a doctor, to go see a religious counselor. All of that is personal information. And we have data. Data is the new gold. Bad actors are not looking to break into your buildings and steal your jewels, your dollars, what have you. They're looking to break into your computer systems. And the scary thing is that 36% of small businesses don't even think about cyber attacks. And 59% believe that their company is too small to be targeted. These things just aren't acceptable anymore. The fact is, small business owners and small businesses themselves are low-hanging fruit. By not paying attention to these issues, by not showing any concern for the possibility of an attack, you're leaving yourself vulnerable. And just by way of example, let's suppose that you've set up a VPN. You haven't used an appropriate service provider. You don't have an appropriate firewall. You don't have appropriate antivirus software in place. All you need is for somebody to be searching the web and looking for open ports, and they're in. I cannot tell you how many of my clients that have contacted me after a data breach that said, oh, well, we didn't have multi-factor authentication. Guys, it's 2023. 2FA. MFA, multi-factor authentication. This is not something that should be a mystery to you anymore. But the fact is that 43% of attacks are going after small businesses. And in 2021, small businesses were spending anywhere between $800, and I assure you that is the minority of the cases, and over $500,000 on cyber events. That was two years ago. You should assume that these numbers have increased exponentially. And the question is, does your budget allow for you to lose that kind of money by continuing to ignore the threat of a cyber, a cyber risk? Sorry about that, folks. And again, if you're not convinced yet, a few more stats. 47% of businesses that have less than 50 employees don't allocate any funds, zero, towards cybersecurity. 51% of small businesses don't utilize any IT security measures. You cannot keep ignoring this. Social engineering attacks are 350% more common for employees of small businesses. Think about that. That's a huge number. What are you guys doing about it? You cannot continue to ignore this, and you have to put into place cybersecurity measures. Now, the other thing to think about, and I go back to the one person who indicated they were subject to HIPAA, also our private investigator, not only do you have to think about cybersecurity to protect your environment, to protect your secret sauce, but you also have to take into consideration privacy rights of individuals. In the state of New Jersey, we still do not have a piece of proactive legislation that says that residents of New Jersey have certain privacy rights. 
However, I'm sure you've all heard about California's Consumer Privacy Act, which was amended more recently, which affords individuals who are residents in the state of California certain privacy laws. Now, when you look at the SBDC's definition of what is a small business, it's a small business that has revenues less than $35 million annually. Well, in California, to be subject to the California Consumer Privacy Act, the benchmark is annual revenues in excess of $25 million. And that's not California-generated revenues. That's revenue generated from anywhere. And if you hit that threshold and you have even one individual, one household in California within your database, you're subject to the California Consumer Privacy Act. Now, I will tell you that there are at least 11 other states besides California that have since adopted privacy laws, including Utah, Colorado, Virginia, Connecticut, Montana, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, by the way, you don't need to worry about because it's really targeted at the folks like Amazon and AW, I'm sorry, um, Twitter and what have you. Florida's law is targeted at big companies. Don't need to worry about that yet. But all the other states that I've just listed out, their benchmarks vary looking at either the number of individuals whose information you have or revenues. So you need to take into consideration where are you doing business? Because the odds are good that you're not just doing business in the four corners of your office. The odds are good that you're doing business online. And if you have business contacts with New York, New York's cybersecurity law, not privacy law, cybersecurity law requires any business that processes any information about individuals in New York have to have in place reasonable measures to protect that information. And if you don't have these reasonable measures in place, and then you do have a data breach, you're subject to liability. New Jersey still does not have a proactive piece of privacy legislation, but we do have a breach notification law, which says that if, God forbid, your systems are impacted and you have personally identifiable information that's exposed, you have reporting obligations, whether it's one person or a hundred people. So you need to be aware of what your obligations are and how you can mitigate the risk to your business. In terms of when these things happen, the average time since COVID for people, especially small business owners, to detect an attack can be anywhere from six to nine months. Think about that. You could have a bad actor sitting in your environment as you're listening to this. And I'm not making this stuff up, guys. You might not realize there's a bad actor lurking in your environment. And right now, figuring out how they can best attack you. And what bad actors do typically is they'll get into your environment and they'll figure out, okay, let's see what type of security is in here. Is there security in here? Are systems segregated? So for example, are files associated with HR cordoned off with a separate password or a separate access credential or not? Is financial information of the company readily available with everything else? Is data encrypted or is it in plain text? And by the way, even if it's encrypted, if you've got somebody who's gotten into your environment, encryption is irrelevant. Once they're in your environment and they figure out how to move around in your systems, then they'll look around and see what else is there. Now, for those of you that have heard me speak previously to SBDC, you've heard this story before, but I do believe it bears repeating. Several years ago, I was contacted by a CPA firm, four full-time employees, four part-time employees. We're talking all of eight employees in total. One of the employees remoted in through a VPN, which was not properly secured. And on the same computer that he used to remote into the CPA's environment, he allowed his nine-year-old son to go on gaming sites. And for any of you who are gamers, you know that gaming sites are ripe for vulnerabilities, for bad actors looking for targets. The people who were on the gaming site with the nine-year-old son followed him back into the computer, said, hmm, there's some interesting stuff here, not just stuff about a nine-year-old gaming. Oh, look, 
there's something about CPA and IRS returns, what have you. And they realized that they could go into the environment of the CPA firm because the VPN was not properly secured. That was in November. Now fast forward to February. We're talking three months later already. And the owner of the firm is working late at night, getting ready to file some returns. And all of a sudden, the return he's working on e-files by itself. He didn't hit anything. He said, hmm, that's odd. Next day, he calls his IT guy and says, something weird happened last night. The IT guy says, oh, you were tired. You probably hit on a button by accident. Don't worry about it. So he didn't. Two weeks later, the same thing happens again. A file, e-files, without him doing anything. Now he's getting concerned, and he contacts his IT guy, and his IT guy contacts the software vendor. And the software vendor says, oh, you probably hit something. Don't worry about it. And by the way, don't forget that your guy can always paper file. They still didn't do anything. When it finally occurred a third time, that's when they picked up the phone and called me. When we brought in the forensic team to examine what was going on in his environment, we found five months worth of activity on his system. And the activity was not just that one event back in November, but what happens is bad actors like to share. They found an open port. And hey, all of my friends in the bad acting world, I found a ripe target. Because guess what? Stolen credentials and stolen social security numbers can be exploited again and again and again. Passwords stored in plain text can be exploited again and again and again. And people are lazy when it comes to passwords. People are notorious for using the same password for multiple accounts or they recycle passwords. So by way of example, let's suppose that my password today was Michelle at 12345. Obviously not the best password, but that's what it is. And that's what I use to log into my work computer. Well, now I'm being prompted by my computer to change my password. So I change my work computer password, but at the same time, I go and change my cell phone password to Michelle at 12345. Well, if the credentials get compromised in one breach, what makes you think the bad actors aren't going to try to target every other account that you have to see if you reuse that password for those other accounts? And when we say other accounts, think about the accounts that you have. Not only do you have your work email, you probably have a Gmail or perhaps an AOL account. You probably have a LinkedIn or a Facebook account. You might have a Venmo account or Zelle. And if you use the same password for all of those accounts or you're recycling passwords, you're making it easy. You're making yourself low-hanging fruit. How do these things happen? Well, let's think about the MGM attack that we all just read about, okay? Now, obviously, huge business. Presumably, MGM actually had pretty good, robust security practices and procedures. However, one person on the help desk got contacted by who they thought was the CISO, who claimed to have lost their credentials, and the help desk was helpful and handed over the credentials that the chief information security officer of MGM had. Hello? Think about this. If that can happen to MGM, what's possible to happen with you? Employees are taking the bait. One of our employees this morning just sent to me an email that they had received. Now, my firm is Kiesa Shin and John Tomasi. In theory, they received an email from Armin Shahinian that said, hey, I need your help. Please click on this link and then call me. Now, the good news is this employee had just attended our annual cyber training. And so they forwarded it to me and they highlighted the email address, which was not Armin's email address, but in fact was managing director slash one gmail.com and said, look, Michelle, I caught a fish. But if this employee hadn't been paying attention and was worried about pleasing a name partner at the law firm that the employee worked, the odds are good they would have taken that bait and they would have clicked on the link. Now, I will tell you several years ago, I got an email from an attorney at another firm in New Jersey. Now, I know a lot of attorneys at this firm. I didn't know this particular guy. 
the email said, please see this proposal and then contact me. Well, given what I do, I didn't just click on the link. I went online. I looked up the firm, sent an email to the attorney who ostensibly sent me this and said, did you send me a proposal to their known email address? I went one step further. I picked up the phone and I called the attorney on the phone number listed on the firm's website and said, hey, this is Michelle Schaap at CSG. I got this email from you about a proposal. Did you send it to me? Well, I get an email back to my email that says, yes, I sent you this proposal. I look forward to hearing from you. Most people at that point probably would have clicked on the proposal and opened it up. I'm not most people. I wait for the phone call back. Sure enough, two hours later, I get a call back from the attorney that says, oh my God, thank you so much for calling me. I had been hacked and I didn't realize it. What had happened was somebody had set up a rule in his email and was forwarding his emails to the bad actor. And then the bad actor was responding to legitimate emails. What the attorney also didn't realize until I had alerted him to this is that this guy was in real estate. He was handling real estate closings, including sharing wire information. The bad actor was taking those wire instructions, changing them, and sending emails out to people saying, by the way, the wire instructions for the closing have changed. Think about that. Commercial real estate tra transactions, millions of dollars are supposed to be wired to one account, and now you've got contrary instructions from this guy's legitimate email because he doesn't know he's been compromised. You have insider threats. You have third-party vendors getting breached, causing small businesses and large ones, for that matter, to be compromised. You have removable media, USB drives. I will tell you, white hat hackers, and these are the good guys that test other vendors to see how they're doing, what they'll do is they'll come to a parking lot like CSG's, and they'll put into our parking lot a USB drive that's CSG branded. I would be willing to bet that at least one employee or even one visitor to our office would see that in the parking lot and say, hmm, I wonder who lost this USB drive. Let me bring it back to my computer, plug it in, and I'll see who lost their USB drive so I can be helpful. Because, by the way, people like to be helpful. Well, if that USB drive is preloaded with malware, I've just now let loose malware into my systems. Now, I will tell you, at my firm, you can't put a USB drive into our laptops. It's blocked. If I have a USB drive that a client sends to me, I have to bring that to our help desk and say, guys, can you please see if this is legit before I use any files on it? That's something you should be thinking about. I will tell you several years ago, there was a convention of the dentist. The ADA had its annual convention. And the codes for different dental procedures were changing. Well, all the dentists are groaning and saying, oh, God, now I have to go back and recode my computer. And the ADA says, no, 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 don't worry. In your packets is a USB drive with the updated codes. Super. Now I don't have to spend the time coding. My reception doesn't have to. Perfect. The first dentist goes back to his office, takes the USB drives that was provided by a reliable source, the ADA itself plugs it into his computer, and he sees the skull and crossbones. The USB drives had been sourced from China, and they were preloaded with malware. There's no way the dentist could have known that that was the case. But that's how these things are happening. The other thing that you may have read about recently in the news is something that had been occurring internationally previously and has now come to an airport near you, is those power towers that you see in the airport. So that if you wanted to charge your computer and you didn't have your cell phone adapter with you, you could plug it into one of these power towers. Well, the problem is the power towers are getting hacked. So while you think you're benignly plugging your device into charge, in fact, what you're doing is plugging into a power tower that has been hacked itself and it's exfiltrating data from this while you're getting power. So instead of using these power towers, make sure you have your cable and then a plug to plug, plug into a good old fashioned outlet to charge your devices. Or if you have one of those briefcases that had its own charging, use that. 
but don't use power towers and certainly don't use them internationally. Weak passwords. Think about how easy it is for somebody to guess employee one, employee two, employee three. And yet one of the women that I was speaking to one day when I was doing cyber training for a networking group said to me, but if I have temporary employees, isn't that the easiest password to give them? Well, it's sure it's easy, but it's certainly easy to guess and compromise to. Unpatched software, particularly for small businesses, is one of the leading causes of compromise. I will tell you, if you get a notice on your cell phone, on your tablet, or anything else that there's an update available, you should assume that that's a euphemism for, I'm the software vendor, I found a vulnerability, and here's a patch. I just don't want to acknowledge the fact that I screwed something up and now you have a vulnerability in your environment. But here's the thing. The bad actors are monitoring those announcements from the Microsofts and all of the other major vendors to see who is pushing out a patch because they realize that eventually you're going to get annoyed and stop hitting remind me later and remind me later, and you will ultimately upload that patch. But because the bad actors know that vulnerability is about to be closed, they'll hit that vulnerability as hard as they can indiscriminately across devices as much as they can until they find the one person or the one device that hasn't applied the patch yet. What's the worst that could happen? You could be a victim of ransomware, a denial of service attack, stolen credentials, remember MGM, miswired funds, think about the attorney I just talked about a few minutes ago, lost or stolen devices or stolen identities. By the way, facial recognition on your cell phone, depending upon which cell phone you have, is not necessarily the best security because if somebody has a picture of you, depending on how your cell phone is set up, they can hold a picture of you up to the cell phone and open your cell phone. So much as I don't like giving my biometrics over to Samsung, I use a thumbprint. So unless somebody's going to be James Bondish and get my thumbprint or my iris skin, those are better things than using a facial scan to unlock your devices. Put that on your homework list. For any of you who are using facial recognition to unlock your device, think about changing that. And by the way, think about changing the password on your home Gmail account. Now, a lot of people don't understand what a denial of service attack is. So let me explain to you in case you haven't heard about this. Denial of service attack is that somebody is hitting your email. Think about the inbox for your company with unwanted emails. And they do it all at once. So that at a certain point, your email system comes to a screeching halt or it's moving really slowly. First of all, that's inconvenient, obviously. Second of all, you might miss an important email. And more importantly, the odds are good in a rush to get your email back up, you'll start clicking on emails indiscriminately. Bad actors are counting on you to do that because those emails, which were sent by the bad actor, may in fact include malware once you click on it or you click on a link embedded in one of those emails. And a distributed denial of service attack or DDoS puts together a whole bunch of other devices and basically creates what they call a bot army to hit your environment with a whole bunch of these unwanted emails. And again, it could be one of two things to either slow down and bring your business to a screeching halt or do that and also cause you to click on a link. Now, God forbid one of these things happens to you. What's at risk? Well, Money, of course, because of the cost it takes for you to recover from this. But it also impacts your reputation. And think about this, internal and external. How good are your employees going to feel if they know that your data is at risk or that your business operations are at risk? Operationally, you're going to be disrupted. Your customers may think twice about using you. And you guys are small vendors. And granted, a lot of business owners want to give business to small vendors, but not if they can't keep their data secure. You could be subject to regulatory fines. I mentioned in New Jersey that if you fail to report a data breach in a, in a timely manner, you will be subject to fines. And of course, you've seen the headlines of class action litigation when data breaches happen and they're not timely reported or that businesses have not used reasonable measures to secure the information. 
We've talked a lot about the different threats that are out there already. One of the things I want to mention is phishing. Phishing is when somebody spoops a voice to leave a message saying, hi, this is the CEO of the company. I'm on a business trip. I need you to wire funds immediately. Or, again, think about the MGM scam. Using AI now puts voice impersonation on steroids. It is so easy to spoof somebody's voice now. They don't need to spoof email. They can just call you up and you might think that it's somebody who you're legitimately doing business. You need to be aware of these things and your employees need to be aware of these things. Internal threats. Some people are just simply not paying attention. But sadly, some people are malicious. And if you've got a disgruntled employee, you've got a problem on your hands. One of my clients came to me after they had had an employee who had been on disability for some time, and they let the the employee on disability go. They did the firing by telephone. The employee saw the writing on the wall when she was called by the president and said, let's have a conference call on Friday. We're going to be talking at noon. Well, the employee got wise to the fact that, yeah, the gig was up. And by the way, she'd been posting on social media that she was out partying, even though she was supposed to be on disability. And during the termination interview, the CEO of the company was watching 27,000 files being exfiltrated and deleted by the employee who was being terminated, whose credentials were still active. Now, of course, the first question is, if an employee is on disability, why are their credentials still active then? Because they're not supposed to be working, so they shouldn't have access to systems. And I will tell you, if you're going to be terminating an employee before the exit interview, deactivate their credentials so that they can't do this to you. BCCs are an easy way for information to go out the door unintentionally. Reply all is a way for information to go out unintentionally. These internal threats are not all malicious. They're people not paying attention nine times out of 10. So what can you guys do proactively to not be low-hanging fruit? Well, first of all, understand what you have. Remember I said data is the new gold. Well, what data are you processing? Is it just your information? Is it customer information? Is it employee information? Is it your customer's secret sauce? Are you developing new tools or new marketing campaigns for your customers that they don't want to get out there before they're ready to launch those campaigns? Once you figure out what your assets are, where are they? Are they on a laptop? Are they on employees' personal devices? Do you keep your phone list connected to your leased vehicle that you're returning to the leasing agent? Do you have leased equipment that's storing information for you? Think about where information is. And by the way, if you have employees working remotely, and my guess is a lot of you do, probably pre-pandemic as well as during pandemic and post-pandemic, are people having paper files at home? Do they have files on personal devices? Once you figure out where all of that information is, understand what laws you're subject to. We mentioned before that at least one of our attendees is subject to HIPAA, either as a healthcare provider or as a business associate to a healthcare provider. If you are subject to HIPAA, if you're subject to FERPA, which applies to anybody who's a service provider in the education industry for schools that are receiving federal funds, you have obligations to secure information. If you're in New Jersey, as I mentioned, there's not a proactive law in the books. But if you're doing business in New York, if you have information about individuals in Massachusetts, you have an obligation to have a written information security program. Then you want to understand where are your vulnerabilities? Where are my potential risks? And how are you going to respond to that risk? Are you going to mitigate the risk? Are you going to assume the risk? Are you going to try to transfer the risk? And by the way, by getting cyber insurance or crime coverage, although that's a means of transferring the resulting liability, the risk itself still exists. 
What preventative measures can you put into place? And what detection measures do you have in place so that you're not waiting five months, eight months, a year until you've detected the intrusion? Have an incident response plan and train your personnel. Now, as a small business owner, I understand that your budgets are limited, but there are things that you can do cost effectively. We've already talked about passwords. Antivirus software is good. It's a basic, but keep in mind, it only protects you against known viruses. So if you have what's called a zero day attack that somebody's never seen before, think about not pet ya, which when it first hit, nobody knew what it was. Antivirus software isn't going to protect you from those types of attacks. Firewalls are important, but only if they're properly configured. Same thing with VPNs. Having a virtual private network is terrific if it's properly configured. Multi-factor authentication. And by the way, it's not just for your work environment. It's also for home accounts. You can activate two-factor authentication for your Gmail account. And if you're not sure how to do that, when you're next in Gmail, go into the help, put in multi-factor or two-factor authentication, and it will walk you through the steps to do it. Put that on your homework. Patching software. Banking online through one standalone computer. So again, think about my little CPA firm. If you're only doing certain things on one computer and not letting little Johnny game on that computer, you're going to be that much more secure. Now, one of the other women who I counseled through the SBDC was being asked to manage a lot of significant personnel data for her clients. And one of the things that I suggested to her, and she in fact followed through with this, was every business that asked her to manage HR information for them, she said to them, okay, I want you to provide to me a company computer. You, my customer, put onto that computer whatever security bells and whistles you want, and I will only use that computer for your business. Now, to the extent that you have multiple companies that you're doing business for, and now you're suddenly inundated with all these individual computers, well, guess what? Just put a little label on it and say, this one's for company one, two, three, this one's for company two, three, four, what have you. And by the way, don't put the company name on the computer. Make it less easy for bad actors who, God forbid, break into your house and steal your computer to figure out whose information it is. But that way, it's not your problem as a small business owner to figure out what reasonable measures your customer may want and put the burden on the customer. Again, train personnel. As was mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, you're going to have these slides after the presentation and after you complete your survey. Let your personnel watch it. Train them so that they understand what they should be doing to protect your business. And by the way, it's enlightened self-interest. They want to get their paychecks. If you're out of business or you're spending half a million dollars to recover from a data breach, you may not be making payroll. Back up your data. If you're not sure where you could back up data, get a hard drive. Back up your data to a hard drive. Back up to a USB drive that's not infected with malware. Encrypt your data. Now, I will tell you that for small business owners, a lot of them say, well, I can't import encryption. Well, I will tell you that a lot of resources like Salesforce will offer either a low cost or a free level of encryption. And it's probably 128-bit encryption, which is not ideal. 256-bit encryption is better, but some encryption is better than no encryption. So cure your physical environment. In fact, we just had this conversation in my office today because our trust and estates practice group is on the first floor of our building where people can come in. One of the attorneys was having a fit because people were propping open the door with a binder. Well, it's great that we have doors that we can't access without a pass, but if somebody's propping open the door with a binder, you've just defeated all the security measures. So what we are going to be putting on our doors now is an alarm. If somebody props open a door, an alarm's going to go off so that it can't be kept propped open. Now, if you're in a lease space, you may not control what is in terms of access to the building that you're in, but then get locked file cabinets. And if you have a landlord that's going to be doing construction in your building, 
and they're telling you, oh, by the way, we're going to have construction people going in and out of your space. The question to your landlord is, okay, how are you going to make sure that my office is secure while your contractors are going through my office? Undertake due diligence on third-party vendors. Now, I will tell you right now, you guys are small business owners. You're not necessarily going to be able to negotiate with those vendors, but you still have an obligation to ask the question. So think about Square and think about your T-shirt seller at a concert, okay? They're using Square or whatever tool they're using to process your credit card payment. They're not going to be able to negotiate terms with Square, but they can at least go onto Square's website and read not only is Square PCI compliant, payment card industry, digital security standard compliant, but they can also see more information about how Square is securing information. If you use ADP to process payroll for you, if you reach out to ADP, again, you may not be able to negotiate a contract with them for indemnification, but they will answer your questions as to what their security measures are. Ask questions. And by the way, for a cleaning crew, ask questions. How are they vetting their employees? Do they do background checks? Do they allow their employees to bring devices into your premises? One of the training sessions I did for a small law firm out in the Lehigh Valley operated it's 35 professionals, another 30 in staff, so a relatively small office, 60 some odd employees. And I asked them, when do people typically leave? And they said, yeah, the place is usually goes town by six o'clock. And I said, and when do the cleaning people start coming in? And they said, yeah, around 5.30. I said, and when do your computers time out? And they said, two hours. Think about that. That means that my screen is up for two hours after I walk out the door. Well, let's suppose I worked at that Lehigh Valley law firm and I'm working diligently at my desk. And then I realize, oh God, it's 5.30. I'm late for my dinner appointment. And I run out and I don't log off my computer. The cleaning crew comes in. They don't need a USB drive to steal my data. All they need is a cell phone to take a picture of what's on my screen because my screen didn't come time out for two hours. And by the way, if I leave on my desk confidential files, what's to say they can't take a picture of what's on my desk? And if you're a CPA and you leave tax returns on your desk, what makes you think that anybody who comes into your office, cleaning crew or otherwise, where you're out at the restroom, isn't taking pictures? One of our clients developed tools for a particular medical device. And they had all sorts of records of different hospital systems that used their tools. They would send those records off to a secure storage facility. However, before the records went to the storage facility, they were lined up in boxes down the hallway in the building. We went there to do a risk assessment for this particular customer. And I look in the first box, open it up, Right there on the top, name, social security number, medical information, address, date of birth, treasure trove. And if I were that cleaning crew that served that building, all I would have to do is go down and take a picture of each piece of paper on top of every box, and I just would have stolen those identities. You need to understand what you're doing with records, and you need to understand what your third-party vendors are doing with those records. And think about who has access within your environment. I mentioned already the employee who's being let go or the employee who's on disability. What about the employee that changes roles? So let's suppose that you have somebody who's been working in HR function, and now they switch over to the sales. They shouldn't still have access to personnel files. Change their credentials. Change what keys they have access to if you keep files in cabinets. You don't need to let the reception of has access to the same information that your CFO does. Now, other things to think about, I mentioned clean desk policy, timing out computers, mobile device management. Now, again, I understand you guys are on limited budgets, but if you have employees that have these devices or tablets or anything else that carry around the same data that their laptop does, if this is stolen, what are you going to do about it? How do you protect your data from being compromised? Well, hopefully this is 
password protected. Better yet, hopefully it's two-factor authentication protected. Ideally, the data on here is encrypted. But on top of that, my law firm has installed on all of our devices, both company-issued and personal devices, mobile software device management that allows for my company to wipe the data on this if I lose it, which means that then when I'm on vacation and my cell phone goes missing, I call back to the office and say, hey, guys, my cell phone is gone. Wipe the data. I realize, again, I'm adding to your budgets, but think about the cost of a breach. Data retention and data destruction. Now, I mentioned that New Jersey doesn't have a piece of proactive privacy legislation. However, New Jersey, along with a whole bunch of other states in the union, have laws about data retention and destruction. If you have records that you don't need anymore that contain sensitive information, get rid of it. I know that we're all pack rats, but don't keep information that you don't need. It's just a disaster waiting to happen. Now, when you guys are working at your customers, the odds are good that you're multitasking. Well, if you're working at one customer's office and you get an email from another customer, don't forward that to whose ever customer office you're in right then and ask them to print it for you. You've just put one customer's data onto the printer or the system of your other customer. We need to think. Now, I always like to add in, particularly if you're going to be sharing this with your personal, how you can be more secure in your personal life. So I was just at CVS the other day picking up a prescription for one of my family members. The person in front of me is asked by the pharmacy, or rather the checkout person, what's your birthday? And of course, they immediately spew out month, day, year. They don't need the year. They just need the month and date. Think about what you're doing and who can hear what you're doing. PSCNG is not going to come to your door and say you're of power is about to be shut off unless you pay me right now. The IRS is not going to email you and tell you that you have to pay your taxes by gift cards. I will tell you several years ago, I was on vacation with my family and I get called by one of my partners, who, by the way, went to Harvard Law and smart person. One of his classmates, also Harvard Law, got a call. This is the FBI. We are coming to arrest you. Give us your social security number. The guy was so flustered, he spewed out his social security number. Click. Person on the other end hangs up the phone. He called his friend, who was a partner of mine, who then called me and said, Michelle, one of my friends is an idiot. What does he do now? We need to be thinking. Don't be tempted by fear. Don't be tempted by wanting to help. We need to take time. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip of my drink while I keep talking. If, God forbid, you are a victim of identity theft or any of your personnel are, quick primer on what you need to do. Immediately file a, reprise, a police report with your local police department. Now, I will tell you, some police report departments are more engaged than others, but without that report... If, God forbid, somebody then uses your credentials, you may be held accountable. If you have that police report, it minimizes your potential liability. Contact your credit card companies. Contact banks. And by the way, don't just think about your own account. And in fact, I did this for one of my clients just the other day whose identity was compromised. And I said to him, you don't want to just change your passwords. You want to tell every one of your family members to change their passwords and implement two-factor authentication. I will tell you, and at the end of this slide deck, you will see some free resources for other information. But again, just some things to have available if, God forbid, you're a victim of identity theft. Again, we need to take the time and think. Don't just click on an attachment, even if it's from somebody that you know. First, pick up the phone and say, hey, did you send this to me? Train your personnel. Somebody saying, yeah, I got it. I got it. It's not enough. Personnel should be trained at least annually. 
There are programs that you can buy that are not expensive that do phishing simulations to test your people. And I will tell you at our office, we do phishing simulations every so often. If you fail a phishing simulation once, then you have to talk to me. If you fail a phishing simulation twice, then you have to talk to the managing partner. Three times, you have to go to one of the named partners to get your paycheck. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to be going to the principal's office to get your paycheck. Get your personal to understand how important this is. Now, again, talking about understanding what your personnel should or should not be doing. People respond to that urgency. I forgot my password. Oh, my God, I need to get this right now. I am the CEO and I've scammed or I've simulated your voice. You need to make people aware of what not to respond to. They have to step back and think. It is so easy to miss a fish. And I always like to use my own name because of my two L's in a row. I realize that this is up on your screen. But if you wear reading glasses, my bet is that you're not necessarily figuring out the difference between the first Michelle S and the second Michelle S except for the fact that I have here two lowercase l's, and here I have one capital I and one lowercase l. Oh, and by the way, this one is a lowercase l. This one is an uppercase I. Bet you didn't catch that one. And it's that easy to miss a spoofed email. Now, take a look at this. Hopefully, most people would not fall for this. However, I will tell you that I practiced in Tokyo for a couple of years. So for me to get an email from a business operating in Tokyo or saying that it was going to be operating in Tokyo and reaching out to me wouldn't necessarily be unreasonable. But again, I am trained to be cautious. And in fact, when I've gotten emails like this, and I have, I go to the company online and I forward this to them and say, by the way, not sure if you realize this, but somebody's spoofing your email. Just thought you might want to know. This is what these things can look like. It may look like it's from Michelle Schaap, but in fact, it's from a fake email, a fake Gmail account. Urgency. Don't let people fall for these things. Make sure that people understand how they can figure out who's sending them an email. All you have to do is hover your mouse over the email to see, oh, I gotcha. And if you're looking at your email on your cell phone, especially at a traffic light, you're not going to pick these things up. Slow down. And think about our video conferences. The last thing you want to do is have somebody Zoom bombing you. So instead, use the tools that Zoom has made avail available. Use meeting passwords. Lock the meeting after all the invited participants have arrived and make sure that people aren't sharing links on a public forum. Now, in terms of what current state laws are out there, as I said, New Jersey does not currently have a privacy law. However, California, Colorado, Virginia, Utah, Connecticut, Iowa, Delaware, Tennessee, Montana, Texas, Nevada. As I said, I didn't bother to throw, throw Florida up here because it doesn't apply to you guys. You also have the FTC Act, you've got FERPA, you've got the New York Shield Act. These are proactive pieces of legislation for either privacy or cybersecurity measures saying that you have to have reasonable measures in place to secure the information that you're processing. The other thing that you should be doing, add this to your homework list, is if you have a website, go onto your website and look at your privacy policy and see what it says. One of my clients had reached out to me and asked me to update their privacy policy for them. And it said at the top, we guarantee your security in all capital letters. Now, we all know we've all gotten enough notices about our information being compromised. The federal government, Aetna, and everybody else in between cannot guarantee our security. Having that statement on your website is a violation of the FTC Act. It is considered a deceptive trade practice. And by the way, New Jersey has its own what they call 
little FTC acts or consumer protection acts, which say that if you have a deceptive trade practice, an email, or rather a website privacy policy that promises something that you cannot deliver, that's a deceptive trade practice that could subject you to liability and to fines. So you need to understand what your website says. And again, you need to understand what type of data you are processing. Now, just because New Jersey doesn't have a proactive piece of legislation with regard to privacy doesn't mean that under common law, and common law, by the way, for those of you who don't know, means case law isn't out there that says that you have a reasonable duty to present a, prevent a foreseeable risk. And the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and by the way, federal courts have also found this in different jurisdictions, is that hacking is a foreseeable risk. And because it is foreseeable, businesses, large and small, need to take reasonable measures to secure their information. Now, in this particular attack, the scam that was used was something that was discussed reported by the IRS in 2015, by the Society for Human Resource Managers in 2016, it was out there. People knew about it. And yet this business did not train its personnel to be on the lookout for it. And basically the compromise or the attack goes like this. You get a call or an email, you're an employee in HR and in a small business, probably that's multiple hats for multiple people. Friday, 4.45, hey, we're having a Department of Labor audit on Monday. I need all the W-2s. You're looking at your watch. It's 4.45. My friends are waiting for me at the bar. Fine. You hit send. You send off the W-2s to your manager, and you go out to the bar, and you meet your friends. On Monday, you come back to work. You want to be a good worker B, and you say to your manager, okay, how can I help you with the Department of Labor audit? And your manager says, what audit? People need to be trained to pick up the phone. You want to make sure if you're in a regulated industry or if you're a contractor to a regulated industry player, what you need to do. If you're subject to the New York State Division of Financial Services regulations, not necessarily because you're in that industry, but because you're a service provider to a bank or a financial institution in New York. If you're a service provider, a business associate to a healthcare provider, if you're a service provider to the insurance industry, if you're a service provider to PSE&G, you have an obligation to take reasonable measures. Now, I will tell you right now that in the state of New Jersey, if you are a government contractor, you have an obligation to report a cyber event within 72 hours. There is a new proposal pending that would require federal government contractors to report a cyber event within eight hours. Think about that. You may not even know that something happened until, oh my God, and then you only have eight hours to report that to federal government? That's a scary proposition. And by the way, if you don't report it, and then it's determined that you, in fact, had a breach that you did not report, whether it's to PSE&G, to the federal government, to the state government, not only will you not get a contract with them again, but you're going to have to disclose that in any future responses to an RFP. Think about the impact on future business that you've just lost there. Supply chain. We need to understand who we're entrusting our data to. And as I said, as a small business owner, although you may not be able to negotiate your contracts, you at least need to understand with whom you're doing business. And by the way, in many cases, you may be the vendor being asked to certify as to your security measures. If you are not, in fact, doing what you've said you've done, you're in breach of contract. And it doesn't have to be anything to do with personally identifiable information. It could be confidential information. So we need to make sure as small business owners what you're doing with your data and who else is touching your data and how are they protecting it or not. Ask your vendors, are you SOC? Do you do SOC audits every year? Do you have questionnaires that you're willing to respond to? Do you do annual risk assessments? What are your financial resources? 
Were you breached last year? And by the way, not every vendor will answer these questions for you, but you could also go online and just do a Google search. Was Joe Schmo breached last year? You might be surprised at what you learn online. And if you are a vendor, don't just say yes to questionnaires. And by the way, same thing for filling out questionnaires for getting cyber insurance. I will tell you, if you get cyber insurance and the questionnaire says, did you have a data breach last year? And you say no, and in fact you did. And then you're looking for that cyber insurance to cover a claim for the next event. If the carrier finds out you had a breach that you did not report, that's a basis for them to deny coverage going forward. And by the way, you better assume that the policy will not be renewed for you either. Negotiate contracts as vendors. Think about this. If you're providing services to your customers and they're asking you to accept unlimited liability, they're probably not paying you enough for you to be their insurance carrier. Have that conversation with your third-party customer. I will share with you one of our clients, small business owner, was contracting with a major utility. The utility wanted her to have $10 million in cyber insurance. She said, Michelle, I can't afford that. I said, so it's really simple. Go back to the utility and say, look, you guys want me to have this. We can deal with this in one of two ways. Either I can increase my pricing or we could share the cost of the premium. And what she ended up doing was negotiating for the utility to share with her the cost of her getting cyber insurance because they wanted to use her. A lot of major companies want to use small businesses. They want to use minority-owned businesses. They want to use women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses. And they may be willing to work with you to bear the cost of getting cyber insurance coverage. Again, if you're using the services of these businesses or providing services, how long are you keeping that information? Are you keeping it longer than you need? And think about what your obligations are in your contracts to your customers. If your contract to your customer says you have to report to the customer within 24 hours that you've had a data event, you better have that written down somewhere. Otherwise, you're going to be in breach of contract. Have a backup plan. If your vendor is compromised and you can't access your environment, if you can't access your data, how are you serving your customers? Do you have a backup of those data? Do you have a backup supplier? Think about these things before the proverbial hmm, hits the fan. Again, have an exit strategy. If you're using a third party, think about cloud vendors, software as a service. How do you get your data back? A lot of those documents will say in their forms, and I draft a lot of these, that say you have 30 days to get your data out of the cloud. Well, if it's day 31 and you haven't gotten your data out of there, guess what? Your data may be gone. And I mentioned leased equipment. Look at the agreement to see, is the leasing company agreeing to wipe the data? when you return the device back to the leasing company. And by the way, do you want to trust the leasing company is actually going to wipe the data or should you be wiping the data yourself? Put it back to factory original settings. Get your data off the device before you return lease equipment. Think about what indemnity obligations you are taking on as a service provider and think about what indemnity obligations your service provider, if any, are giving to you. I go back to the example with Square. Square is not going to indemnify a small business owner. So you need to understand that even though they're PCI compliant, you've chosen that as your vendor. If God forbid there's a compromise, the first person or first entity that your clients are looking at is you. Data minimization. Do not keep information you don't need anymore. I hate to break it to you, but if I was your customer eight years ago and I haven't used your services in eight years, the odds are good you shouldn't still have on file my name, my address, my phone number, my birth date, or anything else. I have to tell you, it drives me crazy that where I went to college and I graduated a long time ago, I come up with these gray hairs naturally. My college is still reaching out to me and wishing me happy birthday. 
I also went to college back in the day when they weren't using ID numbers, they were using social security numbers. Why do they still have this information? And if you have employees that haven't been with you for 10 years, why do you still have that information? Well, Michelle, we have a great deal of information and, and thank you so much. I have pages of pages of notes. Thank you so much. I want to review quickly just a few questions, um, kind of interrupting you, make sure that we are, you know, we are able to answer a few questions that we have. We have about seven questions, but I'm only going to bother you with like two for now. Please. Um, before we are, we, you know, before you end your presentation, um, uh, I just want to interrupt you very quickly. Um, I'm going to pick randomly here. He says, Shelly Christine Risto, she says, what are some affordable solution? What VPN is best? So I don't like to give a recommendation for a particular brand or device, if you will. But what you want to do if you're going to get a VPN is make sure that whoever is setting that up for you is setting it up for you so that it is properly configured and tested. And again, in terms of affordable solutions, and again, remember, you're going to get a copy of this slide deck, is making sure that your personnel have robust passwords. And when I say robust password, that means ideally passwords that are at least 10 or 12 numbers, characters, letters. For whatever reason, I got into my head, my sweet Lord. So first of all, let me just warn you that this example is not a good, strong password. But all of you, if you have a pen handy, write down my sweet Lord. Now, write M2S5L4 exclamation point. M for my, two because my has two letters. S for sweet, five because it has five letters. L for Lord, and four because it has four letters and an exclamation point. That is a random password. Now, again, not enough characters or digits, but come up with a title of a different song or a lyric in a song that sticks in your head, use that as a password or go through a number of songs. Let's suppose that you're a fan of Queen. Go through their greatest hits and pick the first line of your favorite songs and create a password just like that. It's that easy. But by the way, then don't post on Facebook, this is my favorite song of all the Queen songs out there. Wow, One of the questions. very helpful information. Um, we have another question from John Nay Nayer it says, whenever I'm suspicious of an email, I inspect where it came from with micro with microscope. Oh, I guess. Hold on. Uh, no, that wasn't a question. That wasn't a question. Uh, we have Jane Wally says, as a small business, we need several employees to log into some of our software applications with one login because we can afford because we can afford the team or enterprise pricing, which is exponentially higher. How should we handle this then? And how good are password solution like 1Password? Again, I don't like to recommend one particular flavor, whether it's 1Pass or anything else, but I would certainly do a search online to see, for example, let's suppose that I had Michelle Schaap password solution. Google Michelle Chat password solution and data breach to see if I've had a compromise. As far as having only one login, I have to believe that you could set up individual passwords and you can set up two-factor authentication if people, for example, are using a Gmail account or otherwise. And certainly feel free to reach out to me after this presentation. We can talk through what your solutions are and what your options are. But having employee one, employee two, employee three as your access credentials is not going to cut the mustard. That is not a reasonable business practice, whether you are a employee of one or 10. It's not OK. All right. So please, I would like to let all of our attendees. It's 1.16 p.m. I know we have gone over time. If you have to leave, we totally understand. We're very thankful for your presence and for taking notes and participating and taking all the information that Michelle has provided us today, including all this information about security. 
I we understand that. Please make sure you fill out the three minute survey. That will be great, great for the uh, Michelle as a speaker and for future speaking speakers coming. Um, right now, Michelle will continue and we will review more questions once she's done. So thank you so much for your time. I will turn my camera off right now. Thank you, Michelle. And I apologize because I thought we were going till 1.30. So I was speaking more slowly than I might usually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump ahead in my slide deck to just hit some highlights. So for those of you that are hanging in here with us for a few more minutes, I appreciate it. And I apologize for going through this quickly, but I want to make sure that you get some really important points here. So bear with me here. And I mentioned having an incident response plan. Now, your personnel should be part of that plan. This card that I created for my office, and I know you can't see it, I'm holding it up to the screen, but it's really teeny tiny for you. I will share this template through the SBDC. And what it is, is a four by six card that gives just a handful of prompts for our personnel. Lost or stolen device, cyber incident, contact from a client or law enforcement, office or file compromise. And then it tells you who to call. It gives a work number, an alternative phone number, a work email, an alternative email, because every single one of your employees is part of that incident response plan. And they need to know to whom to report because these things don't happen conveniently. They happen on Friday at 445. They happen on July 4th holiday. And you want your personnel to know who to report. If you take the time to put together an, a written incident response plan, don't store it on the computer or you're not going to be able to access it if your computer is shut down. Now, one of the things I want to touch on quickly was generative AI. Something for you guys to think about. If you put into generative AI a query like, what's a good elevator speech for somebody who's in marketing to pitch their business? You're not giving away the store here. However, if you put into generative AI, I'm having a problem with this software code. Could you fix it for me? You've just put that code out into the internet. An employee from Samsung did just that. An employee from Amazon did just that. They put proprietary code out into generative AI and there went any privacy or security associated with that code. Think about if you're working on a pitch for one of your clients to develop a marketing plan and you ask generative AI to create a marketing plan for you. It may be the best marketing plan on the planet, but number one, it's now out there as part of the collective knowledge of the generative AI tool. And you cannot own the copyright, nor can your customer. So just something to think about with AI. Now, the last thing I want to touch on with you guys before we go away is miswired funds. So again, bear with me. I'm going to scroll quickly. And let's see. Okay. This is something, again, what can you guys do cost effectively? Train your personnel. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, when you get this slide deck, and you will be getting it from us, BDC, after you fill out your survey, instruct your people what to do if they get a change of wire instruction or a change of payment instruction from any customer. You must verify that it's a legitimate change in instruction. If, God forbid, you miss wire funds, report it immediately. I will tell you that part of our firm's incident response plan includes the forms that our banks require for reporting miswired funds. We have the names of our relationship managers and their phone numbers. I have the FBI portal and I have the New Jersey state portal so that if God forbid we miswire funds, we can deal with it quickly. If you report it within 48 to 72 hours, you have a fighting chance of getting back your money. If you wait longer than that, assume the money is gone. Now, just some quick reminders, update your software, don't click on unexpected links, backup data, restrict users access, think about least privilege, and use strong 
filters. These resources are available to you for free. I repeat that. These are all free resources. Now, what's nice about the SANS Institute is that, and that's this one here, is that they give you forms. If you want to come up with templates for written policies and procedures, the one thing to keep in mind, the only policy you shouldn't adopt is the one that you're not going to follow or you follow in the exception. CIS controls gives you a list of 18 controls to apply to your business. I would take a look at NIST resources that are available online, but make sure that you're looking at the NIST resources for small businesses, not for multinational businesses. There are different flavors of NIST resources. That's this one here. If you're not already a member of the KIC, please sign up today. And in fact, today would be a good day to sign up because every Thursday, the KIC puts out its list of the latest and greatest attacks hitting businesses operating in the Garden State. And by the way, it's the KIC that you would be reporting a cyber event also. Take advantage of these free resources. Take advantage of these public-private partnerships. And of course, the SBDC is, in many cases, a free resource for small businesses. So with that, folks, thank you so much for staying with us. I know we're after time. I appreciate your time, your diligence. Please do not be the low-hanging fruit. When you see the slide deck next, and I apologize, the SBDC, it will be SBDC branded. You can contact the SBDC to get access to me. Please stay safe, stay secure, and I will stick around for a few more minutes if anybody has any questions that they would still like to throw out there. Wow, Michelle, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. I, based on all your information, I found a few sections that I need to polish on my marketing agency because it's not so much of the sensitivity, but more of the copywriting aspects of things that I want to make sure that all the information and all the creativity still stays locked in um, within the agency. So thank you so much. For everyone here you have, I would you know, once again, thank you, Michelle. I will take a quick screenshot um, of Michelle's information to follow up with her. I will be sharing my screen now. Um, I want to make sure that you guys um, stay up to date with the SBDC and take advantage of all the resources we provide. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a marketing agency and my success, my much of my success has come from mentorship by the SBDC. So very, very thankful. We're going to move into Q&A sections right now. Um, let me move on to the next screen. Um, I hope you put all your questions in the Q&A box. We have 10 more, five more minutes um, to answer your questions. Are you guys ready? So we had Fred, Fred. Callis, it says, can you share the video and the slide set? Can you address the future with the race of AI quantum computer? Are we in trouble and what should we be looking for to help us? Mm, that's a very interesting question. I will answer, Michelle, half of the questions to help you out. We always share all the power, all, all the videos, um, presentations on our website. So you can always go back. I put it like super slow so you can take more notes and listen to it again to make sure you don't miss one single step on Michelle's presentation or any one of our presenters. And if you fill out that three minute survey, you will also get the entire presentation in your inbox. Now Michelle can answer the rest of the question. <laughs> so Fred, you are more knowledgeable than most people in this space. But I will tell you right now with AI, the genie is already out of the bottle. And it's funny, I presented yesterday to a different group on generative AI and the pros and cons. And one of my fellow presenters was quoting from Jurassic Park, and I'm hoping I'm going to get this quote correct from Jeff Goldblum. And it was, while we were asking ourselves, could we do this? We didn't bother to ask ourselves, should we do this? With generative AI, 
don't get me wrong. There are some wonderful resources in generative AI. And in fact, it's funny, my son contacted me yesterday and he's putting together an RFP. And I saw somebody was asking about an RFP for looking to hire an IT resource. And I said to my son, I can't believe I'm saying this, but put into chat GPT, what would be a good questionnaire or a good RFP for fill in the blank? And for that type of query, I think generative AI can be a very useful tool. That type of information, those types of asks, you can get useful information out of it. But here's the problem. First of all, again, I mentioned the lack of confidentiality. Second, the lack of ownership. But the other thing to keep in mind is one of the problems with generative AI is it's potentially garbage in, garbage out, meaning that these tools learn from what is out there on the internet. And if it's being fed with misinformation or bad information, then the fact is you're not going to be getting reliable information back. The other thing to keep in mind is that these tools in some cases hallucinate, meaning that they give you things that don't exist. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but there was an attorney who filed a brief in New York that was citing case law that was wrong. The cases he was citing didn't stand for the proposition that he was citing to. And he didn't bother to check the sources that Generative AI quoted for him. The attorney was fined, I believe it was only $5,000, which I think is a slap on the wrist. But it's a cautionary tale. One of my favorite riddles that was put to Generative AI was, which weighs more, two pounds of feather or one pound of brick? And the answer was, they weigh the same, one pound. So you need to take whatever you get back from these tools with a grain of salt. So I know that's somewhat of a long-winded answer to a couple of questions about generative AI, but yes, you do have wonderful tools with AI. I mean, think about the leaps and bounds that happen just in medical research with generative AI, but you need to be cautious and think about what you're putting in there. Now, I say I recently received notification to update my software, but it didn't go to my cell phone, so I updated myself. How can I check? So if you open up your cell phone and you check settings, you'll see within settings, are there updates available? That's how you can check to see if there are updates available. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking at, is it safe to go to my Zelle or Venmo information for any potential customers? So I will tell you that we pay my dog walker using Venmo. What you want to do is check the settings on your Venmo account. Don't have them be public. And I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. I was sitting at Thanksgiving dinner last year next to my husband and my brother-in-law was sitting next to my husband and they were paying for tickets they were getting for each other. And my brother-in-law turns to my husband and says, oh, I see that you sent money for this and you sent money for that. Now, mind you, he couldn't see the individual accounts, but he could see what other transactions my husband had been involved with. And I looked at my husband and I said, really? You didn't change the private setting on your Venmo account? Go to Venmo's site. Go to Zelle's site and it will walk you through how you can better secure your account. Make sure that you are doing that. Let's see. I've turned away customers because I thought the customer were suspicious. There are some customers who are suspicious. I will tell you, and I wish it were easier to spot these days, but it's not. You can't just count on seeing an email saying, hi, you won the lottery. Send your information here. Hi, I'm a Nigerian prince and I need to be adopted. Okay. Those types of scams are not out there anymore. They are looking, phishing emails look better and better. They're spoofing Chase. They're spoofing FedEx. Hi, you're missing a package. Contact us here. Put in your password. If you get an unsolicited email about a missing package, about a customer that sounds too good to be true, vet the potential customer. Vet the email. Go to the internet. Find the known site. Do your own due diligence. All right. Great, Michelle. That, that was awesome. We have one last question here. Um, this is, I, I, I want to get into it. I says, um, I have a developer in India that helps me with my website. 
whenever I decide to stop the service, I suddenly get malware hitting my website. I want to cut them off, but not sure if they are if there are the ones embedding malware into the website, I end up hiring them to clean out everything. My gut feeling is to fire them. The short answer is yes, fire them. However, I will tell you right now before you fire them, because remember, if they have the keys to your kingdom, which I assume they do as the developer for you, and they've probably embedded back doors, before they realize that their opportunity to attack you is about to close, I would get a hold of a third-party vendor to help you secure your environment. Now, I will tell you through the SBDC, certainly out of the Essex County SBDC, we have a resource, and I assume the state SBDC also has a forensic resource that you could reach out to. I can also, if you want to contact me separately, give you the names of some forensic resources that are cost-effective for small businesses. But you absolutely want to know what backdoors exist in your environment, and you you should assume that this developer has put backdoors in there. Great. Not to make you paranoid, but in this instance, your instincts are dead on. Great. That was, I I, thank you for answering that because I've had clients in that situation and I tell them like, you need to, we need to secure the website first. And we talk to another developer at home, someone who is reliable, responsible, and then you can cut off the other people because that situation happens more than often. All right, please, everyone, thank you so much for coming to this webinar. Again, tons of knowledge. Um, Make sure you scan this QR code. And if you have a friend or know someone who who has a business and you believe that they would you know, they would find useful to have a counselor, to have a mentor, make sure they scan this QR code. You can take a picture and send it to them. For next week, I will also be hosting this amazing webinar that says Mastering Expenses with QuickBooks Online. Make sure you scan this QR code to take advantage of this great information. We're about to end the year, so you need to make sure that you have all your information into your QuickBooks so you can have a strong end of the year. Thank you so much for coming. Make sure you scan this QR code once again to have um, counseling, to get the additional help. We are NJSBDC. We have helped over 15,000, and I am one of those 15,000, um, help businesses grow. We provide no-cost business consulting. We train. We provide training and events starting at zero cost, and we provide exclusive small business resources to help your business grow thrive, and be an amazing, amazing business and hit all your goals. Once again, thank you, Michelle, uh, for this amazing presentation. I took a ton of notes. I'm sure everyone else did. If you want to follow us, make sure you follow all our social media networks and you will find Michelle in also on the website, like I mentioned earlier, you will find additional replays of the previous presentations. Thank you so much for your time. Make sure you fill out that three-minute survey and have a great day. And I'll see you next week, everyone. Thank you for coming.